I'm Ryan O'Dowd, and you're listening to Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine YouTube channel. Today we start a new book, number nine, The Incarnation of Ahriman, Seven Lectures by Rudolf Steiner. We start with chapter nine, one. The Incarnation of Ahriman, the Embodiment of Evil on Earth. Seven lectures given between October and December 1919. Rudolf Steiner. Table of Contents. Introduction by Savak Golbekian. 1. Lecture in Dornock, 21st of November 1919. 2. Zurich, 27th of October 1919. 3. Dornock, 1st November 1919. 4. Dornock, 2nd of November 1919. 5. Bern, 4th of November 1919. 6 in Stuttgart, 25 December 1919, and finally 7 in Stuttgart, 28th of December 1919. Editor's note, that's my birthday. Introduction. Ahriman and Antichrist. It's a remarkable fact that during a speaking career spanning two decades and over 6,000 lectures, Rudolf Steiner referred to the concept of Ahriman's physical incarnation in human form only eight times. Seven of the lectures, given towards the end of 1919 in four different locations, are reproduced here in unedited form with the exception of Lecture 1 that included a preamble not relevant to the theme. Relevant passages from the remaining lecture can be found in the notes. Given the sparsity of the material, we have taken the decision to include the full lectures in this volume, despite the evident repetition that occurs in some of them. As is typical of the free-form noteless lecture style that Steiner pioneered, readers will find important additional material in many of the lectures. The seven lectures are certainly worthy of being read side by side, and given the urgency with which Rudolf Steiner speaks on the question, those serious about anthroposophy may wish to undertake such a study. The lectures have been arranged chronologically, with the exception of Lecture 1, which has a more introductory character. Here, Steiner also gives clear definitions of the beings he denotes as Lucifer and Ariamon, and emphasizes the significance of the cosmic triad, Lucifer, Christ, and Ariamon, as opposed to dualistic views of Christ and a single opposing force of evil. To be found, for example, in Goethe's Faust in the form of Mephisto. The force for good, Christ, occupies a central position as pivotal equilibrium between the opposing forces of Lucifer and Ahriman. Steiner's basic premise is that Ahriman will incarnate in the West before a part of this third millennium has passed, as a counterpoint to the physical incarnation of Lucifer in the East in the third millennium BC. The balancing point is the incarnation as the beginning of the modern era of Jesus Christ in Palestine whose culminating deed Steiner calls the mystery of Golgotha. The idea of a being who opposes Christ and incarnates in a human body is well established in popular culture, and perhaps typified by the film trilogy The Omen. In the film's narrative, the main character, Damien Thorne, loses his mother and father in mysterious circumstances, and is adopted by his wealthy uncle. Gradually, he eliminates all who stand in his way, while he establishes a powerful position as CEO of a multinational corporation, and has made the American ambassador to England. He's regarded as a creative thinker and an attractive, charismatic individual. However, Damien is possessed by the Antichrist, and in the final part of the trilogy, the final conflict, he attempts to disrupt the second coming of Jesus Christ. Although he's eventually deposed, he does manage to deceive many about his true nature and intentions. What is the source of these ideas? The earliest allusions to such a narrative are to be found in the Bible itself. Remarkably, the word Antichrist is used only by John in the Bible, in his Epistles to the Faithful, where he warns there are many Antichrists. In fact, John defines Antichrist as he that denieth the Father and Son. John is probably relating his comments to the message found in several passages attributed to Christ throughout the Gospels. In Matthew's Gospel, for example, Christ refers to false Christ and false prophets who would show great signs and wonders with the potential to deceive the very elect. The idea of evil masquerading as good is also articulated by the Apostle Paul, who speaks of that man of sin, the son of perdition, 
who will put himself in the place of God, showing that he is God, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Biblical scholars argue about the concept of Paul's man of sin, some believing that it derives from the Old Testament, principally the book of Daniel, while others claim that Paul received original inspiration. Perhaps the most famous references to such an evil entity are to be found in chapter 13 of St. John's visionary book, The Revelation. Although this section of the Bible is written in a different style, one which appears to call for pictorial and imaginative consciousness, nevertheless it also tells of an individual who deceives humanity using miracles and wonders. Here the evil being, the beast, famously forces all the world's people to receive a mark on their right hand or forehead. Without this mark they can neither buy nor sell. Many fundamentalist Christian tracts draw on all these references to create a composite narrative. In particular, much is made of the above reference from Revelation in relation to future predictions that the world's population may have microchips inserted into their skin. Without such a mark of the beast, it is said, nobody will be able to buy or sell. However, it is unlikely that the figure of the beast and the figure of the Antichrist referred to in the biblical quotations above are one and the same entity. So how does all this relate, if at all, to Steiner's prophetic statements about the incarnation of Ahriman? Steiner is very specific about the conditions that would allow the being of Ahriman to carry out his mission. As we read in these lectures, they include the prevalence of the modern scientific and mechanical conception of the universe, the tendency to view social dynamics in society solely from an economic point of view, acceptance of the principle of nationality as the solution to the problems of humanity, the popularity of the system of party politics, the spread of fundamentalist and simplistic evangelical interpretations of Christianity, in particular the emphasis on Jesus as a simple man of good ethics as opposed to the principle of the cosmic Christ, and the spread of an aridly intellectual life of culture. Since all these phenomena can be observed today, it seems likely that the incarnation of the being of Ahriman is imminent. However, Steiner was somewhat vague about what exactly Ahriman would do on Earth, and what sort of person he might actually be in the flesh. In one striking passage in Lecture 5, he comes closest to this by stating that the Ahrimanic power is seeking, via the incarnation of Ahriman, to utterly mislead and corrupt humanity on Earth. Nevertheless, Steiner also says repeatedly in his, the lectures that his incarnation could not and should not be averted. It's meant to happen, and under the right conditions could benefit human evolution. The critical thing is that people should be sufficiently awake to recognize Ahriman for what he is. Only if Ahriman were to go unrecognized would this event be wholly calamitous for the evolution of the earth and humanity. For Rudolf Steiner, Ahriman was synonymous with the biblical Satan, although distinct from Lucifer, whom he relates to the being referred to as the devil. However, Steiner also spoke in some detail about another spiritual entity in opposing principle to the Lamb that he calls the Sun Demon, or Sorath, and relates to the apocalyptic number 666. On Steiner's terms, then, it would be more accurate to perceive this being the adversary of the Lamb as literally the Antichrist. One literary depiction of the concept of Antichrist which has not received nearly as much attention as the references in the Bible is to be found in the work of the 19th century Russian philosopher and poet Vladimir Solovyov. His book, War, Progress, and the End of History, contains a truly remarkable short story of the Antichrist. Although Solovyov clearly states that he is speaking of the Antichrist and he is a fictional tale, it is nevertheless instructive in relation to our study of the incarnation of Ahriman. Solovyov's concise tale is in contemporary times with the following scenario. A pan-Mongolian movement has resulted in the Japanese leading a unified Eastern Asia, comprising Japan, Korea, China, and Indochina. Creating a colossal army, the pan-Mongolians march across Russia, Eastern Europe, and into Germany, France, and England. Here they create a great empire which lasts for half a century until it's eventually deposed by a unified Europe. This painful colonial experience causes the European nations to form a United States of Europe. It is into this context that a great man is born. By the age of 33, many recognize him as a superman. Spiritually brilliant, a great thinker, a genius of exceptional beauty and nobility of character, a philanthropist, ascetic, etc. Although he believes in God, Salavyov tells us that the great man truly loved only himself. He respects the Christ of the Gospels, but in reality he believes that he has a more important mission. One night, the great man is contemplating the nature of Jesus Christ when he feels great fear followed by a burning envy. 
and eventually an intense hatred of the Christian Savior. In a fit of madness, he attempts to take his own life, but is saved by a supernatural force which speaks to him in his desperation. This force, the Antichrist, incorporates himself into the very being of the great man and takes possession of him. Now changed, he displays a supernatural inspired brilliance that surpasses even his previous state. With his newfound genius, he writes a great work, The Open Way to Universal Peace and Prosperity, which is soon translated and published in all the major languages of the world. The book, which is received with great acclaim, appears to answer all the central questions people have and is accepted as the revelation of the complete truth. Eventually, he is elected lifetime president of the United States of Europe and eventually emperor. Very soon, all the nations of the world voluntarily submit to his dominion, and so begins a great reign of peace. Indeed, in the very first year of his reign, the great man promises and manages to establish peace around the world. In the second year, he promises and again delivers universal prosperity, solving all the world's social and economic problems. In his third year, understanding that people want amusement in addition to peace and prosperity, he appoints a mysterious magician from the east, Apollonius, who, as the emperor's constant companion, gives the nations of the world the possibility of never-ending enjoyment of most diverse and extraordinary miracles. Finally, having resolved all other major problems, the emperor seeks to address the religious question. Beginning with Christianity, he calls a great congress of all its representatives, consisting principally of the Catholic, Protestant, Evangelical, and Orthodox churches. In an immense temple created in Jerusalem for the unification of all religions, the Antichrist attempts to impose his will on the Christian representatives by asking them to accept him as their sole protector and patron. Many of the assembled Christians are enticed by his entreaties and temptations, and only a small band from each of the major confessions hold out against him. Two of their leaders are eventually killed by lightning after they recognize and expose the emperor as the Antichrist. The remaining small group of dissenters is sent away from the city. In contrast, the other groups of various Christian denominations cement their relationship with their new leader by accepting his magician Apollonius as their common pope. The story ends with a great apocalyptic battle followed by an enormous earthquake and the eruption of a great volcano which swallows up the great emperor and his forces. The Antichrist is defeated principally, one assumes, because he has been recognized, at least by a small group of people. Solovyov's story is particularly valuable for its treatment of evil itself. He shows us that the presence of evil in the world is far more complex phenomenon than we are accustomed to believe. Indeed, he challenges our very perception of it by demonstrating how easily evil can appear to be good. As one of this character's observes, all that glitters is not gold. One is reminded of the words by Steiner, quoted above that Ahriman will seek to utterly mislead and corrupt humanity on earth. This is not to say that the incarnation of Ahriman will conform to Solovyov's tale of the Antichrist. However, given Steiner's repeated calls to his audience for wakefulness, Solovyov's tale offers invaluable instruction in ways of perceiving the world and interpreting contemporary events. How often do we distinguish between glitter and gold? Amidst the fog of media hype and dazzling digital technology, would we be sufficiently awake to the manipulations of such a great man today, or to Ariman himself? That written by Sevek Gobekian, May 2006. Thus concludes Chapter 9-1 of The Incarnation of Ariman by Rudolf Steiner. Next week we will continue with 9-2, lecture written in Dornach. 21st November 1919. I will see you then. Alam.